the second session of the day, which will be dedicated to surveillance and counseling in patients with heritable aortic disorders. Our moderators uh, for this session are Do Dr. Lewis, who you heard earlier, Dr. Reed Piritz from Philadelphia, and Dr. Francois Tournou, uh, who is a cardiologist at the University Hospital um, for the University of Montreal. So um, after the three talks, there will be the case-based panel discussion. I will invite um, the, sp the speakers as well as the previous uh, speakers from the earlier session to come up on stage. And uh, we have three cases that, we, that have been prepared um, which I think will uh, uh, illustrate some of the dilemmas and challenges in managing these patients. So, François? Thank you very much. I'm going to introduce our first speaker, Dr. François-Pierre Monjon. Dr. Monjon is an invasive adult congenital cardiologist at the Montreal Heart Institute. He's also uh, one of the co-founders of the Outer and Connective Tissue Clinic at the Montreal Heart Institute. He's really involved in uh, non-cardiac uh, imaging, and he's going to talk about um, imaging the outer and vascular tree. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. So uh, these are my disclosures. Uh, so the objectives that I was given were to understand the role of multimodality imaging in the diagnosis and follow-up of aortic disorder and to gain insight on the specific role of each imaging method and identify the proper use for each in different clinical contexts. So as much as we don't like diameters because they are sometimes difficult to deal with, they are still at the center of our clinical practice and from that seminal paper Imaging derived aortic size uh, are among the three of major risk factors for aortic events in Marfan syndrome. Uh, the surgical thresholds, uh, you all know them, they are available from guidelines. They vary a little bit depending on where you read, but still, a lot of the practice is still based on aortic size. So the question is actually how to measure it. But first, uh, imagers like to look at the aorta. We've heard in the past that the, the aortic root looks Marfan-like, which is the pear shape. Uh, the loss of the sinotubular junction is associated with faster progression and maybe more aortic events, while the ascending aorta dilatation you see more with bicuspid valve. You see also more with hypertensive aortic and heart disease, so therefore, uh, there is a distinction, at least in my practice, between an ascending aorta diagnosis, which is this, and an aortic root diagnosis, which is that. Uh, so this is what the aortic root looks like on transesophageal echocardiography uh, in long axis and how the measurements are made. So this is the aortic root. This is the ascending aorta. For those of you who work in the echo lab, do not neglect the right parasternal view to outline the ascending aorta in its middle and often distal part. It may display it better than the classic parasternal long axis view. Uh, and both in echo and in MRI, it's important to measure the aorta at consistent landmarks in addition to the largest diameter so that the studies are longitudinally comparable. So these are the standards uh, landmarks on uh, a 3D reformat of uh, aortic MRA. The aortic root is actually composed of four parts, the annulus, the sinuses of Valsalva, the sinotubular junction, and the ascending aorta, and all diameters should be available and reported in uh, imaging studies. Classically, in echocardiography, we will measure from leading edge to leading edge, although there was, uh, in the past years, some diameters that were taken from inner edge to inner edge, and that will change a little bit, uh, a few millimeters, but that may make an aorta looks progressive or non-progressive, so it's important to ensure consistency from uh, exam to exam. There is also uh, some uh, variations depending if you work as a pediatrician or an adult cardiologist because the pediatric echo guidelines will say to measure in systole where the aorta is at its maximum expansion, where the adult guidelines will recommend diastole, which is thought to be more reproducible, and leading edge to leading edge measurement. So again, from going from pediatric to adult care, that may induce a change in the aortic diameter and has impact on longitudinal follow-up. 
Uh, we also favor using axial imaging, which is CT or CMR, that the aorta should be measured in double, from double oblique views, recreating a true short axis of the root. Uh, and then it can be measured either from cusp to commissure or from cusp to cusp. And the, these diameters compare variably with echocardiography. And the normals are probably a little bit different uh, depending on the measurement method, which should be reported in the imaging report. This is what uh, um, multiplanar reconstruction looks like. Uh, so you have two orthogonal views, and it produces what we would call the true en face or a true short axis view. And why is it important? It's because if your diameter, your surgical threshold is set at 50, and you use a straight axial view like you would get for those of you working in hospitals, you open the packs, you open the CT scan, you just look at the straight axial and draw a line, which is like that. The aorta is kind of oval, and it measures 53 millimeters. If you take time to do an axial re uh, a multiplanar reconstruction, the true diameter is actually 48 millimeters. So the patient just passed from surgical to careful observation with a um, simple measurement. There is also controversy depending on the guidelines whether the aortic edge uh, should be included or not, which is that in uh, where during the cardiac cycle should the measurement we be made and which exact diameter should be reported. The key is that in a single institution for longitudinal studies, the measurements are made in a consistent way with agreement between the readers and uh, that so you can compare longitudinally. And if there is a doubt, sadly, there is only one way but to go back to the images and remeasure. So a few points on how to measure the aorta. So it should be done on ECG-gated images perpendicular to the axis of blood flow and using multiplanar reconstruction at reliable and reproducible anatomical landmarks and at the largest diameter. There is no consensus on wall inclusion, but remember that echo uses leading edge to leading edge, but that inner edge to inner edge is often used in MRA or CTA, and there is no exact consensus on how the sinuses of Valsalva should be measured, whether you account for the fact that there are three petals or whether you just do a, a single diameter like echo does. Nevertheless, the, uh, the method should be documented in the report and screenshots of key measurements should be available for review. Serial imaging with the same modality that best demonstrate the aortic segment of interest is preferred. And if you see progression, you should always document um, the, the progression with, uh, Im with an imaging modality that uses uh, multiplanar reconstruction. We would usually call a significant change five millimeters and echo three millimeters by four MRA or CTA. And, your, and the measurements should account for age, sex, body surface area, and the phase of cardiac cycle. So what first take home message, aortic imaging guidelines are not standardized. At the very least, a single center should standardize its measurements and always be critical of the measurements that you're given as a clinician. And so now what's normal? So there are a bunch of normal studies that report the normal aortic size. You see that it changes depending on age and body size. 40 millimeters is usually a good number to remember. But remember that in a, a male uh, older than 65 with a large BSA, uh, it can go up to 42, 43 could be with the normal. Similar data exists for CMR with, again, 40 millimeter as a rough threshold of what's normal and what's not normal. When it's, it becomes particularly important to pay attention to body size when dealing with Turner syndrome. Turner, patients with Turner syndrome uh, have a higher risk of uh, dissection than the general population, which is about 36 per 1,000. There are risk factors, notably the bicuspid aortic valve, hypertension, and pregnancy. Uh, and elective surgery is, the, is recommended if the diameter is larger than 2.5 centimeters per meter square. Often these patients with a diameter of 35 millimeter will go to echo lab, get their pictures done, and be told, oh, your aorta is normal. Yes, it's normal for a normal size individual, but it's dilated for their size. So this is how we approach patients with Turner syndrome. Less than 20 millimeters, they should have surveillance every five years. But above 20 millimeters per meter square, or with a bicuspid aortic valve, a coarctation, or hypertension, then follow-up should be um, tightened. 
So the normal aortic size, remember, always depends on body size and beware of Turner syndrome. Sometimes we could use alternative measurements to account for body size. So diameters that we frequently use do not account for a small size individual. They do not account for eccentric dilatation of the aortic root if you report only one diameter. Therefore, they may miss a patient at risk. So some uh, users have recommended that we should use the diam an index diameter or the, or, the, um, or the indexed aortic area because there is also data that shows that if you use the aortic area, you may pick up dilatation that would be unrecognized by the diameter. So that's one way. The other way is to use uh, Z-scores, uh, to use Z-scores. Z-scores are very, are necessary in pediatrics to account for growth. They are very impopular in adult medicine. Uh, you have to remember that they are derived from echocardiography diameters, not double oblique images as I've shown you before that depending on the formula that is used to calculate the Z-score, BSA may significantly influence the formula and therefore obese patients or overweight patients will have their aortic size underestimated. So the least we can do is to choose a formula that is less affected by age and body weight and there is comparative data in patients with Marfan syndrome as to which formula is the best one. So this is an example with the uh, indexed aortic area. So these uh, these uh, investigators have found that patients uh, with a diameter below a surgical uh, threshold but with an enlarged aortic area with the threshold set at 10 centimeters square per meter had excess mortality in absence of aortic surgery and therefore in that particular group a diameter above 5 centimeter was not predictive. So maybe the area is a, is a is a better diameter, but I think ultimately it will have the same limitations of, uh, as the diameters. So another take home message, Z-scores are misleading in underweight and overweight individual. Maybe indexed aortic area will uh, make it to clinical practice, but still the studies are quite small. When picking your imaging modality, you have to remember that the imaging modality all have pros and cons. So. Actually, CT and geography is probably the one with the most pros. CMR is uh, close, uh, close behind, uh, and uh, transthoracic echo uh, uh, is very available, non-invasive, uh, but it has a few limitations. Uh, the most important, one of the most important, being operator dependency. We don't, uh, we ne almost never use uh, invasive aortography anymore, except for intervention purposes. So this is an example of a comprehensive CMR examination of the aorta and aortic root. So you see a severely enlarged root, pear-shaped. This is a patient with Marfan syndrome. You see it here on this 3D reformat that actually all the aorta is large, but the root is particularly large. You can, uh, CMR can confirm that the aortic valve is tricuspid in this case. This is a nice emphasis view of the root and that there is severe aortic regurgitation that you can see here with a 42% regurgitation fraction. So CMR offers a very comprehensive exam. Uh, we are moving more and more trying to avoid giving contrast during CMR and this data is interesting because here you see uh, a contrast enhanced magnetic resonance and geography and you see that because the lumen that contains the contrast is so bright that the wall is actually more difficult to see. If we adjust the window level to try to reduce the blurring, it's better but it's not perfect but non-contrast MRA provides better delineation of the wall and these images are routinely gated to both ECG and respiration so they tend to be very good even for the root or the aortic annulus. So we, we try to measure it, to, to use that modality more and more often and especially for repeated studies, it doesn't require the administration of contrast so that always makes patients and providers uh, feeling more safe. CT and geography is a great modality. It's easily gated. It's done within 10 minutes. It can be done with the low dose radiation now. And it's really the preferred imaging modality for urgent assessment of the aorta coming from the ER. This is a case of uh, aortic dissection. And you can see it from this, this center line reconstruction going from the root uh, all the way to the descending aorta. Uh, 
radiation dose is often a concern with CT, but now with, uh, with um, dual source CT, which are actually two X-ray tubes that are rotating at 90 degree, the radiation dose is, uh, can be minimized, uh, also, and, and we also time the imaging to diastole when the aorta is not moving or is moving less due to cardiac contraction. So, um, uh, uh, so we don't image during systole where the images would be thrown out anyway. Uh, so the concerns with um, exposure to radiation is becoming less and less uh, important. So how does ECHO and CMR compare? Uh, well, they are both reproducible for the aortic root, but CMR is more reproducible than uh, transthoracic ECHO, not surprisingly. Transthoracic ECHO is less reproducible for the, the ascending aorta and the distal aorta, but CMR is highly reproducible for that, and also CMR can do cross-sectional diameter, which is a major plus. Remember that the aortic root can enlarge asymmetrically. It's much more easier to see that on axial imaging. Uh, ECHO and CTA also compare very well. Cusp to cusp diameter CTA is more comparable to transthoracic ECHO with a mean difference of one millimeter. Uh, and cusp to commissure diameter uh, are usually smaller than the TEE reported diameter. So that may explain why a patient would, would have an enlarged root on the screening ECHO, be sent for a scan, and come back with an aorta that's actually smaller. Um, but Still, the question that remains to be answered is that all these diameter thresholds that we know about, those are derived from echo mostly. Therefore, we don't know in reality which diameters are predictive of outcome with each imaging modality. So what's the, ju the judicious use of CMR or CT? Well, it should be done at diagnosis and generally at infrequent intervals thereafter. Uh, you should ask your imagers to report cusp to commissure and cusp to cusp aortic group diameter for more informed comparison between imaging modality. And these uh, axial modalities should be used more frequently if the echo windows are poor, if you are getting close to the surgical threshold, if you know that there is significant root asymmetry, if they, or if you're following dilatation of a distal uh, aorta. It's also a key part of postoperative follow-up and of post-dissection follow-up for which echo has except for assessing the aortic valve, a um, much less important role. So I will add uh, one take home message. So prefer non-contrast MRA or low dose CTA for aortic follow-up. This is uh, just to give you a flavor of what we do uh, in cardiology practice with diameters in case of uh, Marfan syndrome, for example. So from the baseline images, some patients will go directly to uh, a surgical uh, criteria but others will be followed uh, more or less frequently depending on the size and progression. What's this, I always find this study interesting. So what's the difference between aortic dilatation and bicuspid aortic valve, which is common, 1% of the, uh, 1%, maybe 2% uh, versus Marfan syndrome? Well, the same proportion of patients have a dilated aorta, but the ones with Marfan seems to progress more. But again, aortic diameters are not perfect, and that's been said before. In this large registry, only 13 patients uh, who had aortic dissection actually had a diameter that was, at, that was at surgical threshold. So therefore, there should be other ways of identifying patients at risk. Uh, it seems that patients uh, who have FBN1 mutation and aplo insufficiency have a larger aortic root at baseline faster growth and a higher risk for dissection, which should mandate a stricter imaging follow-up. It's been also alluded that 4D flow MRI can be useful. It has to, still has to be done uh, in, by experienced operators, but interestingly, in Marfan syndrome, you, uh, vortical flow, so abnormal uh, 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 tornado-like flow, is found in the aortic isthmus, which is a, a known site for aortic susceptibility to dissection, so perhaps this will play a role uh, in risk assessment. And there has been conflicting data in the past about using aortic dis distensibility and aortic rigidity uh, as a predictor of event, but that recent data shows that longitudinal strain, so how much the aorta extends uh, on uh, longitudinally, so from valve to higher on this axis, 
seems to be predictive of aortic dilatation rate, aortic root dilatation rate, and aortic events. So perhaps another element to put in eventual risk scores. So another key point, confirm the progression of aortic size with CMR and CTA. And now moving to uh, the abnormal uh, aortic valves. So a lot of patients with connective tissue disorder will have some variation on the aortic valve. Um, so, so you see all the four classical forms here. And as I said, it's uh, somewhat of a strange animal that's in the intersection of family history, an aortic aneurysm and a bicuspid aortic valve with variable prevalence depending on the clinical situation. And we approach bicuspid valve in a similar way as we do for Marfan syndrome. So uh, some patients have surgic, uh, reach surgical threshold right away and other undergo uh, fo imaging follow-up and sometimes medical treatment for which the guidelines are not so sure. Lois Dietz syndrome, uh, you've heard a lot about. You, you will er, hear later that it uh, is characterized notably by uh, vessel tortuosity. So if you ever performed an MRA and see this kind of things, you should look at the aorta. And there are also follow-up guidelines for imaging in Lois Dietz syndrome, uh, which includes head to, almost head to toe or head to pelvis uh, follow-up at regular intervals depending on the presence or absence of anomaly. Interestingly, when I was reviewing the literature, I found that brain imaging, uh, uh, that uh, patients with ACTA2 mut mutations uh, can have some um, distinctive brain imaging features. Uh, therefore, if patients undergo, it, it, might, it may be worth it first to do brain imaging in patients with a non ACTA2 mutation, or if patients get brain imaging for another reason, the, uh, these findings may um, suggest that uh, an ACTA2 mutation is present, in addition to the classical Moya Moya presentation. So patients with uh, familial thoracic aortic uh, aneurysm and dissection uh, also follow uh, imaging uh, follow-up algorithms sim uh, somewhat similar to the ones for other disease. Uh, and the same for Ehlers-Danlos syndromes. There isn't really imaging guidelines for Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, so we tend to do head-to-toe imaging that's fairly similar to what we do for patients with Lewis Dietz syndrome. So I will finish with six take-home messages about aortic uh, imaging. So imaging guidelines, remember, are not standardized, and at the very least, centers should standardize, standardize them locally and always be critical of the measurements that you're given. Normal aortic size will depend on body size, so beware of Turner syndrome and uh, patients in the extremes of weights if you're using Z-scores. The index aortic area may eventually be used in addition to the, to the diameter to better risk stratify patients. Prefer uh, non-contrast magnetic resonance uh, angiography or a low-dose CTA for a follow-up of aortic disease. Um, always confirm the progression of aortic size with CMR or CTA and uh, be sure to, uh, especially in doubt, to image the vascular tree from head to pelvis, uh, to pelvis particularly in non-Marfan aerotopathy. So thank you very much for your attention. This is a nice summary of, uh, that I've written uh, about what I just said. So, uh, and uh, you've seen this slide from Dr. Laberge before. Uh, so this is our team in Montreal, both at the Montreal Heart Institute and at St. Justin Hospital uh, to follow patients with aortic disease. Thank you very much.